Welcome back. In this lesson we are going to learn about the main idea of the Monte Carlo method. We are going to learn the advantages and disadvantages of the method and we are going to learn about what kind of problems can we solve with the Monte Carlo method. In order to understand what the Monte Carlo method is, let me first divide all the possible problems into two groups, the group of deterministic problems and the group of stochastic problems. The deterministic problems are those for which we know the solution without any uncertainty, while the stochastic problems have a solution that can be expressed only in terms of the mean value associated with some kind of stochastic deviation. Typically this happens when the solution contains some noise or fluctuations. The methods that we use to solve the problems can also be divided into deterministic methods and stochastic methods and uh, the deterministic methods provide solutions that do not have any kind of uncertainties, while the stochastic methods provide solutions that have uncertainties. So they are in a form of a mean value and statistical deviation. Very commonly we apply the deterministic methods on deterministic problems. In that case we are using the tools provided by the numerical analysis. We can also apply deterministic methods on stochastic problems, in which case we have to use the probability theory. Interestingly, we can uh, apply stochastic methods on a deterministic problem and such methods we call Monte Carlo methods. Interestingly, we get a solution with some uncertainty for a problem that doesn't have any uncertainty in its solution. We can also use a stochastic method to find solution of a stochastic problem, in which case we should say that we obtain the solution by a simple simulation. So in simple words, the Monte Carlo method is a way of solving a deterministic problem by a stochastic approach, during which random numbers need to be generated. Let's have a look at a simple example of how the Monte Carlo method can solve a neutron transport problem. Let's assume that uh, we have a source of neutrons and we want to calculate a response of a detector which is uh, placed at certain distance from the neutron source. Now we can start using the random numbers to simulate histories of neutrons that are released from the neutron source. We need two random numbers to sample the direction in 3D. So for instance we select direction in this way. Then we need another random number to decide the distance to the next collision. So uh, let's say that we decide the distance has this length. Then we need to decide what kind of nuclear reaction is simulated. It can be scattering, it can be capture or it can be fission. So uh, randomly we decide, for instance, scattering reaction. In that case we have to decide the new direction. Then we again need two random numbers and we need to decide new energy. Now we need another random number 
to sample the distance to the next collision. So let's see that the collision is here. And again, we have to decide the reaction type. For that reason, we need to generate a new random number. Then we have to sample the new direction in case the scattering reaction was chosen. In case the neutron was captured, we can uh, finish simulation of the actual neutron history and we proceed to the simulation of another neutron history. So let's let's say that this particular neutron history ended here. The neutron was captured. Then we simulate another neutron history that ended here. The neutron history may end by other means. For instance, the neutron may leak out of the system. So in that case, we can also stop following the neutron. Now, if you simulate a large number of histories of neutrons that are generated by the neutron source, eventually you will get some histories that will cross the volume of the detector. So those will contribute to the computed response of the detector. Now, if we simulate millions or hundreds of millions of neutron histories, we will collect many histories that will contribute to the detector response and we can derive a solution that will have sufficiently low statistical deviation. So let me just summarize the idea of the Monte Carlo method when applied to the neutron transport simulation. Basically, the method simulates a large number of independent neutron histories. The results are collected. So in our case, it was the detector response, but there may be other kind of results. For instance, the multiplication factor for a fissile system or it could be the power distribution or the spatial distribution of the neutron flux, the reaction rates and all kind of results that you may possibly require. The results are collected and averaged over all the simulated uh, neutron histories. So these data are processed, the mean value is obtained and the statistical deviation is calculated. Right, so what kind of problems are suitable for the Monte Carlo method? Typically these are deterministic problems which are very hard, very difficult to solve by deterministic methods. In principle, all deterministic problems can be solved by deterministic methods. However, those problems which are very complex require very severe approximations, simplifications, and these approximations are then reflected into errors in the results. So, uh, if we do not want to accept large errors in the results, we typically use the Monte Carlo method. Let me highlight the advantages and disadvantages of the Monte Carlo method applied to neutron transport simulations. First of all, it is the simplicity. The method is simple. It doesn't have to know the transport equation at all. The method simply simulates a large number of neutron histories and it derives the results by uh, combining the results of all the simulated histories. The method only needs to know very simple rules in order to simulate the neutron transport. Another big advantage is the ability to 
simulate the transport in any geometry. So the geometry can be very complex and the Monte Carlo method does not need to apply any simplifications to the geometry. Not only to the geometry, but not even to the transport of neutrons. So we can use continuous energy cross-sections. That is something what is simply impossible for solvers which are based on deterministic methods. This feature makes the Monte Carlo method especially suitable in research and development of new nuclear reactors because every time we do a change in the geometry of the nuclear reactor we can simply use the same Monte Carlo solver to simulate the neutron transport and we can uh, step by step improve the design of the reactor without making any changes to the solver. That is something what is impossible with solvers that are based on deterministic methods. Every time you change a geometry of the reactor, you would also have to make changes to the solver itself. It would be very difficult to develop a new system if you only had a deterministic solver. The ability to use the continuous energy cross-sections is also very important because it means that the same library of neutron cross-sections can be used for all possible reactor types. Boiling water reactors, pressurized water reactors, fast reactors, any kind of reactors we can simulate with the same library of neutron cross-sections. That is something what is impossible for solvers that are based on deterministic methods. Such solvers use so-called group cross-sections, where the groups are collapsed over neutron energies, and this must reflect the specific energy spectrum in the, in the system. So every time when a geometry is changed, the neutron energy spectrum is changed and therefore the group library needs to be regenerated. And that is a very cumbersome procedure that can be completely eliminated by using the Monte Carlo based solvers. The advantage of the Monte Carlo method is also its efficiency or better to say its convergence rate in uh, complex problems. Uh, we know that the statistical error typically decays inversely to the square root of the number of simulated neutron histories. The Monte Carlo method has disadvantages as well. The biggest one is the computational cost of the simulation in case we want to achieve a very small uncertainty in the result. A Monte Carlo simulation of a nuclear reactor may take many days or weeks of the computing time and some problem may be solved only on a supercomputer. The presence of the statistical error may also be viewed as a disadvantage. However, this is rather questionable whether this is an advantage or disadvantage because all numerical methods will provide results with some error and it is much better to have some estimate of the error. Let's review the major components of the Monte Carlo method. First of all, we will have to sample values to a large number of random variables such as the distance between two neutron collisions or the reaction type, many other random variables. And in order to be able to sample values to these random variables, we need to have a good description of the random variables. And we can have the description in the form of the probability distribution functions. We are going to learn about these functions in the next mini lesson. In order to 
sample values for random variables, we also need the so-called random number generator. So, and we will cover that in one of the future mini lesson. Another component is the sampling rule, which basically transforms a number generated by the random number generator. It transforms this number into a value that uh, we sample the specific uh, random variable, such as the distance between two collisions. Then we also need procedures to score or tally the results, and we need procedures to calculate the statistical deviation in the results. A very important topic in uh, the theory of the Monte Carlo method are techniques that improve the efficiency of the Monte Carlo simulation, and we call these techniques variance reduction techniques. So. Uh, they try to reduce the statistical errors in the results without causing too big impact on the computing time. Now, the computers that we have today, including supercomputers, are heavily parallelized computing machines. They contain hundreds, thousands, or hundreds of thousands computing units, CPUs, and we need procedures in our simulation that allow utilizing the full potential of such computers. So therefore we need to parallelize our simulation. So that is also a very important topic. Let's have a look at the typical application of the Monte Carlo method. In physics, the Monte Carlo method is primarily used for simulation of the transport of neutrons, photons, electrons, and possibly other particles. However, the method is not limited to the application in physics. It is used in other fields as well. The Monte Carlo method is widely used in mathematics, for instance, for solving of multidimensional integrals. The method is used also in chemistry, in biology, and in economics, for instance, for simulation of the stock market, and it is used in other fields as well. Specifically in the nuclear engineering, the Monte Carlo based codes are not only used for research and development of uh, nuclear reactors, they are also used for benchmarking of deterministic codes. So, uh, Monte Carlo simulations are used to provide reference solutions against which deterministic uh, codes are benchmarked. Often, Monte Carlo codes are used in so-called shielding problems, for which uh, deterministic codes are not very suitable. In shielding calculations, we basically want to calculate neutron flux outside of the nuclear reactor and for this kind of simulations the deterministic solvers are not adapted. Nowadays there are many Monte Carlo codes for reactor physics calculations. The most established one is MCMP written in Los Alamos and it has a very long history. There are probably about 20 uh, codes, which are on very similar level to MCMP, written in different institutions all around the world. Uh, this is just very short list, only four examples. Among them you can find Tripoli, written in CA in Sakle, Kino from Oak Ridge, Serpent from VTT. Serpent is a relatively new code and we are going to use this code in our course. So we are going to work with the serpent code. However, from the user point of view, the serpent code and MCMP, they are very similar. So once you learn to 
to write the input file for Serpent, you can basically use MCMP as well. There are very small differences between the input files. And that would be all for now, and we will meet in the next mini-lesson.